Hello, my name is Phil Brandon. I'm with the plant pathology department at the University of Georgia. And today I'm going to be talking to you about black root rot and soil applied fungicides for strawberries. And so uh, without hesitation, we'll get started. Some of the information I'll be talking about, or a lot of it actually can be found in the Southern Region Small Fruit Consortium uh, website at www.smallfruits.org. Uh, look under IPM production guides for the strawberry guide. And that will provide you with uh, some of the background for this uh, presentation and some additional information as well. So I'll start out by talking about black root rot of strawberry. And I, I'll say this several times, but this is a disease complex. I've used this definition in presentations uh, for a long time. It's from Jay Scheid at Oregon State. And he says that black root rot is a complex, complex interaction of many fungi, nematodes, and poor soil characteristics. Organisms or factors involved in one area may not be involved in others, and that's true. The thing is, almost everywhere you grow strawberries, you can have black root rot, though. And so the components may be a little bit different, the type of nematodes or the type of fungi uh, as influenced by the environment and the soil, but you can have it uh, anywhere that you're growing strawberries. Uh, it is a disease complex. It's also, in a lot of cases, a replant disorder because we do tend to grow strawberries behind strawberries, and that often does exacerbate or make this worse. And so it is uh, also, in my mind, a uh, replant disorder, although you can have it even where you haven't had strawberries in the field for some period of time. The symptoms are a general blackening or a dark discoloration of the roots, poor root growth, and poor foliage growth and health and soil fumigation is required uh, currently for control of this disease. One of the principal components or primary components of black root rot actually is related to nematodes. So it's not necessarily fungal, but these nematodes can cause damage to the roots directly. Uh, and then that can also uh, provide an entry point for a lot of the fungi that can infect roots. And so the combination of nematodes with fungal organisms in the soil is particularly critical to this complex. And so uh, nematode management is a large part of the black root rot complex. Also involved in this are fungal organisms such as Rhizoctonia so shown here, but also Fusarium species and uh, Phytophthora and Pythium and quite a few other organisms that can be in the soil. And we don't even know necessarily all the different organisms that may be involved in this complex, but all of these are tied together uh, again to cause black root rot. So what does it look like? Well, if you look at the root system on the right, you can see how it's generally white and clean when washed out. You compare that to the root system on the left, which is dark and black, and uh, most of the roots have some disease occurring in them. And so that is black root rot. And so it's a pretty simple uh, explanation as to why it's called that. So when you have that complex, uh, you're not gonna have a healthy root system and your plants will not do well and produce well. So what is the solution? We still generally use in uh, plastic culture systems uh, fumigants, and that's a, uh, a thing that we've been doing for a long time. Uh, the uh, fumigant of choice used to be methyl bromide. Of course, that was phased out with the Montreal protocols, uh, and we have a limited number of fumigants that we can utilize now. But fumigation is a critical method for controlling black root rot, killing out uh, nematodes and other for f fungal organisms that are in the soil and providing a good uh, basis for the initial planting of the strawberry so that you don't have this disease. So fumigation is critical. Uh, when I'm talking about fumigation at this point, I'm talking about chemicals. There are some other uh, things that are being researched just that are more environmentally friendly, uh, more user friendly potentially as well. Uh, some of those are mentioned in the strawberry guide, but we're not yet uh, recommending those. They're just uh, still in the research phase. And uh, so we'll see how those go over time, but we're still mainly involved in fumigation with chemicals. These chemicals are dangerous. I would recommend that anybody who is not fully aware of how to apply these materials, not, not do it themselves. I would recommend a custom applicator. And there's also specialized licenses that are required now for a lot of these fumigants and certainly a lot of regulations that are involved, but the, it's still our best uh, shot at uh, controlling this, this disease complex. So what do we have out there? Metam sodium, which is uh, called Vapam or sometimes the uh, similar products uh, such as Kpam, uh, is, is one of the critical old materials that we still utilize. Uh, it's a good fungicide. It's not as great as a nematicide or herbicide uh, as far as the, uh, the activity, but it, it does, uh, especially in combination with other chemicals, uh, make for some uh, nice fungicidal activity. So it is one of the components that we utilize. It is actually very dangerous as well. It is safer than most other fumigants, but it's still pretty dangerous. One to uh, three dichloropropene, which is in Telone or Telone 2 or various formulations such as Picclor, 
Uh, you'll find that that material also being utilized for strawberries. It is generally mixed with chlorpicrum and at a minimum. Uh, so like a pit chlor type, uh, pit chlor 60 would be a good example of that. We rarely would use this alone in strawberries. We do in some other commodities, but it, it's mainly active on nematodes. It's not a great fungicide or herbicide, but when you combine it with some of the other uh, products, and uh, especially if you use it under uh, a VIF or virtually impermeable film, uh, it actually can ki uh, kill out weeds and help to kill out weeds as well and, and can provide other activity, but it's mainly a nematicide. Chloropicrin is a little bit more gaseous or volatile than some of these other uh, fumigants, uh, but it's uh, still one of the old standbys. And it's usually mixed with the telone at a minimum uh, for our production in strawberries. And so Picklor 60 is one of our kind of go-to products that we will utilize. I still like to see the combination of all three of these. Uh, it's very difficult to put it out, but if you want to get close to methyl bromide, uh, it is costly, but that is the way to go. Uh, Chlorpicrin by itself is not that active, but when you combine it at high enough rates with some of the other chemicals, it actually works pretty well as part of this, this uh, fumigation uh, matrix that we're going to apply. So I want to show you some old data, but I don't know of anything that's a whole lot better that's out there, but this will just explain where we are with fumigants at this time. Uh, in the last 20 years, we've had uh, dimethyl disulfide as a fumigate, and it was released for a while, and mainly due to uh, issues with smell, uh, some other potential issues, it was, uh, it was no longer continued. Uh, methyl iodide was tested for a while. We thought that might be a replacement for methyl bromide, and then that uh, also uh, was taken away from us or, or was not continued to, uh, in the market. So we're still left with these three fumigants as our main fumigants that we've worked with. I'm going to show you this data. This is methyl bromide in uh, looking at the, comparing it to particularly telone, which uh, C35, which is a combination of 1,3-dichloropropene uh, and the uh, chlorpicrin. And so I'll talk about that. And then putting out the VAPAM at different rates, but uh, looking at it as a combination of what we would call a three-way uh, type approach. And that's where you can get pretty close to the same kind of yields uh, and results on black root rot that you get with methyl bromide. So we look at the methyl bromide, uh, nice yields. You look at telone and VAPAM. Again, pretty nice yields. In this particular trial, we were using kind of a mid-range of the VAPAM, uh, but it, it was comparable to still, or getting close to, with two, two different treatments that had this. We repeated that twice to where we were with the uh, methyl bromide. You notice the inline, which is basically uh, the uh, pretty close to the equivalent of Telon C35, but applied through the drip tape in a different formulation, does not perform as well. So when you put it through drip tape, uh, even with the VAPAM, it just doesn't perform quite as well in general. And, and there's a reason for that. And we'll talk about that in a minute. This is 2001, 2002 data. Again, same thing. You look at the yield with the methyl bromide, compare that to the Telon C35 uh, along with the Vapam. That shows again that this Telon, chlorpicrin, Vapam combination, especially when the Vapam is at the higher rate, is comparable to, comparable to, if not better than, methyl bromide in this trial. So again, a very good combination that works very well to get rid of this uh, complex of uh, organisms. Again, the end line in no case does it work as well as incorporating the fumigant throughout the entire soil bed prior to pulling the bed. And so uh, that's, um, that's something you need to be aware of. So end line is not something that works uh, comparably. Again, another year showing the same thing, methyl bromide compared to the telon uh, C35 and the VAPAM. Uh, so again, chloropicrin with the telone and then also the VAPAM at the high rate in particular is what is required. I think that you really need to go to that high rate of VAPAM in order to get something that's going to be comparable to. And it's sometimes a little bit numerically better than uh, methyl bromide. So it's a, it's a really nice combination. And again, the inline just not quite as good. There's just uh, a reason for that. Same thing, showing it twice. So why is the inline not as good? Inline goes through the drip tape. So any of these fumigants that are applied through the drip tape, uh, a lot of them are going to work in the water phase. Uh, and so once you get the water out to a certain uh, point in the soil, you can see here it does not extend from the drip tape if you're laying a single line of drip tape all the way into all parts of that bed. And so when you're planting two rows of strawberries, you've got two different rows of strawberries and then you're actually getting roots that are going into non-fumigated soil, you can see why that would not work well. And so uh, just using some dye and water, uh, some researchers at the University of Georgia were able to show that years ago.
We'll talk about another aspect of soil borne diseases now, kind of switching gears away from just strictly the black root rot. Phytophthora can be a component in the black root rot complex, but it also develops as its own disease throughout the season. And, and there's really three different types of Phytophthora we're talking about. The predominant one we deal with is crown rot, and then sometimes we see the uh, leather rot and red steel. But uh, mainly we're looking at the crown rot. Uh, these uh, crown rot and leather rot pathogens are genetically distinct, uh, but they're very similar. Uh, and red steel is actually a different uh, species as well. So what does this look like? This is Phytophthora crown rot. This is an example of it. I'll show you another one in a minute, but you can see this kind of reddening, discoloration in the roots, again, the blackening of the roots as well. Uh, but adequate soil drainage helps to prevent the spread. And so this is one thing you cannot get away from, and I'll mention it again in this presentation. Uh, you want to have your strawberry plants in an area that's well-drained. Uh, Phytophthora is always going to be a problem if you do not have adequate drainage or if you overwet your beds. Either way, you're going to have more Phytophthora. So the balance of uh, water is very critical and good drainage. Uh, the way to, again, look at this and see if it's Phytophthora, if you cut uh, with a knife through the crown of this plant, basically from north to south through this crown, you see that reddening, that, that should not be there. Uh, all of that crown should be white. Uh, and when you see reddening, that means something is wrong. And this is a, a good example of Phytophthora crown and root rot. And it's a good diagnostic. There's some other things also that cause that kind of reddening. Anthracnose causes some reddening, a little bit different look to it. Uh, as does uh, the new neopestilociopsis is another example of that. So there are other fungal organisms uh, that can cause similar type reddening. So if you question this, you might want to contact your extension agent to try to send off some samples to make sure that you're getting the best diagnosis that you can. But in general, if I cut through and see that, uh, that's Phytophthora crown and root bot. So you, you can get to the point that you can identify it yourself. Uh, leather rot is a little bit different. Uh, it's generally going to be a leathery type of a fruit rot. Uh, it also does occur, uh, but again, I've not seen this often in the 20 years I've been in Georgia. It may occur in other locations more than in Georgia, uh, but it is also a Phytophthora problem. And then red steel, I've only seen this, I think, once in all the time that I've been in, in Georgia. So it's very rare for us. Again, you may see more of that Phytophthora disease. It uh, produces this kind of a red discoloration in the roots, and all of these are associated with these poorly drained areas. So again, site selection, making sure your drainage is uh, good, is going to be critical for Phytophthora management. If you have any areas of standing water, you need to figure out how to get rid of that. Uh, you've got to do something different, uh, drain tile or something to reduce uh, that, kind of an, uh, that kind of standing water, or just don't plant in that area. And also make sure you don't overwet your soils uh, through the drip tape. So what do you do for Phytophthora? Well, first of all, don't bring it in if possible. It's much easier for us to say that uh, make sure you're I don't even know where you could get a certified plant actually for strawberries, but it's easy for us to say that. Uh, but the bottom line is you do want a reputable nursery, one that does uh, produce good plants consistently. And if you can find that, uh, that that's important. And you don't want a, uh, a nursery that's actually selling you plants that have a lot of Phytophthora in them already, although it's difficult for them to, to always produce a clean, completely clean product. And then uh, the, I've already talked about the fumigation laying down the plastic mulch. Of course, that's going to be critical to controlling Phytophthora uh, in the field before you get in. So you got to try to not bring it in, and then you want to kill out anything that was there in any previous years. And then phosphite materials such as Profite or Aliette, those are really good for drenching uh, the plants when they come in. You can uh, do that, and you will get uptake through the foliage and the soil, uh, and then you want to plant those plants quickly. But uh, those are actually active on Pythium and Phytophthora, so it's another thing you can do. Uh, I don't think a lot of people actually do this, but it, it can be done on the transplants to try to keep from taking that to the field and at least give the plants a little bit of a boost uh, against those two diseases. And then there's some materials you can put out after planting. Uh, Ritamil Gold is still my favorite, although I will say that I think resistance is becoming more of an issue against Mephanoxam, which is in Ritamil Gold. So that's something we need to look at more in the next uh, few years, potentially throughout the Southeast. But it's still the most active material generally if you have Phytophthora. And then these phosphonates like Aliet and Profite, they're good, but they're not as good as Ritamil Gold. I said uh, Ritamil Gold will not raise the dead, but it comes pretty close when it's active. These other products, if you apply them in a preventative uh, uh, role, they can be good. And I do recommend that you use them, 
uh, so that you can uh, not uh, go to Ritamil Gold all the time for your Phytophthora uh, management because we do need resistance management built in as well. As far as timing on when Ritamil can go out, well, when you, you've transplanted your strawberry plants, they're generally watered in. There's a lot of excess water. And then your root system starts to develop and hopefully you get some new leaves. I, I think that's a good application time frame to put in some Ritamil if you just want to do it preventatively. So sometime in October, probably late October, early November, where you still have some growth, still the roots are developing. Particularly if you look at this root growth in here, that's not a bad time. That's going to vary by location. So we're talking about the whole of the Southeast. That, that timing may be a little bit different for you. But again, after you have the transplants go in the soil, they're given some time to develop some new roots and new leaves. That's not a bad idea to put out some Ritamil to try to help them to reduce Phytophthora as you're going into the winter time. For us, there's another uh, flush of uh, growth that's going to occur sometime in late February or March. I would generally say March is our time frame in Georgia for application of Ritamil. But once you hit that, that flush of growth, uh, at some point, you can put out Ritamil then again as a preventative type thing, trying to kill out any phytophthora that's there. It has about a month of activity, so it's a pretty long lasting material. And then there is a third application you can make in April or May, if you're, especially if you're running into problems. If you don't see any problems, I would say just don't do that. Uh, not everybody puts out preventative applications. Some people do just wait to see if they're going to see any phytophthora. And I can't argue against that, although when you see it, uh, oftentimes it can be difficult to get it under control. So that's, but this is an option, just looking at Ritamil and how you'd use it. Again, uh, the root growth is what you're trying to time with. So make sure you put that out according to uh, what time the root growth is occurring in your particular location. And then you do have three applications. Again, I've told you how I think you can utilize those. So make sure you follow all label directions and uh, don't overuse it. But at the same time, it is a good product out there, especially if you do see Phytophthora and if you don't have resistance. So what about the resistance development? Well, we've known for some period of time that this can obviously occur. Mephinoxam does develop resistance. It doesn't develop resistance as rapidly as some of the other materials, uh, but it is starting to show up uh, based on... Some of the problems we've seen in the field, some reports coming out of the field the last few years where we've put out methanoxam as yes, Ritamil Gold, uh, and we have not seen great control of Phytophthora. I do wonder if we're not uh, getting some resistance to develop at this time. It's something we need to look at throughout the Southeast. It'd be a good joint project for us to try to answer that question. And then of course, if you utilize it only then uh, by itself and don't put out some of the phosphonates, you're going to select for resistance as well. And at that point, we just don't have that many options, really. I mean, that, that's one of the problems we run into. Hopefully, we can get some more registrations of some other materials from some different modes of action. But as of today, these, these are the options we have. And I've already mentioned the phosphites. Again, they're not quite as good, but you can throw them into your mix. I generally recommend these as foliar applications as opposed to uh, going through the drip tape. But some of the labels for phosphite-based chemicals will allow for a drip tape application as well. We just don't know how, to, how they work by comparison to foliar applications. So that concludes my presentation. Uh, again, the black root rot complex and phytophthora, these are all soil borne type issues that you can run into. The only other thing that you might run into is a soil borne issue or a crown issue would be rhizoctonia. And you can uh, utilize things like a bound applied uh, in a lot of water to try to get it into the crown and that will help with rhizoctonia. Uh, but that's really about it. Those are the main issues that we would have. So that concludes my presentation. I hope uh, you can utilize all the other uh, things that we have out there in the way of resources. Uh, make sure to contact your county agent if you have any additional questions, and we're always glad to help.